Hey internet, I'm Simon Squibb, your host at the Good Luck Club podcast. Our mission is to help anybody out there that's thinking of starting a business do just that. Equally, if you've started a business and are struggling, maybe you need a little bit of inspiration and knowledge. And we hope by interviewing some of the world's most successful entrepreneurs and change makers that you'll get the knowledge you need to become the person you want and turn your business into that dream company. I personally have started 17 companies from scratch and have invested in over 65 startups. I left school at 15 with near zero education and was able to retire at 40. When I sat down and analyzed how I did it, I discovered a secret. It was all luck. So in each episode, I'm here to tell you, in my opinion, no matter what you're building, shipping or thinking, without luck, it ain't gonna work. Each week, I will discuss with my guests this theory and test it and see if luck is a skill as I feel it is and if it's possible to pass it on to the next generation of entrepreneurs. I hope you enjoy our episode this week. So yeah, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us live from Hong Kong. It's a pleasure to be here. Please uh, tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Yat. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Outplace, which was started in 1998. So we're one of the, I guess, earlier technology companies in Hong Kong. Uh, and currently also um, sort of chairman of Animoca Brands, which is uh, a public company that is basically in the blockchain gaming space. Uh, with, and also a uh, tech investor, um, particularly focused on edtech, but also in sort of all sorts of gaming, entertainment, and media. Um, and, uh, you know, father of three, uh, living in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is home, uh, but, you know, usually a jet setter, but right now stuck because of coronavirus. And oddly enjoying the fact that um, I don't have to travel and everyone's willing to do video conference calls. Yeah, are you missing the jet setter lifestyle? Well, I think the nice thing about the jet setter lifestyle was I actually could rest more because at least I had the flight time where I could sort of chill. And also people were expecting to meet me uh, and therefore they were okay to say, okay, let's meet next week or two weeks and so on. Now it's like, well, it's okay. We don't have to arrange a schedule two weeks from now. It's like, can we get on a call tomorrow? Can we can schedule something right away? Can we have a call at 1 a.m.? You know, all that kind of stuff. It's uh, it's uh, it's become much more 24-7 totally. at times, uh, which is both um, uh, exciting, but also more tiring, I find. So I think a new kind of balance is needed soon. Well, I'm, I'm a father of one. You're a father of three. I, I, I want to go on a business trip to get some sleep, and I'm only a father of one. So I completely understand uh, what you mean. Well, um, I want to talk, uh, you didn't mention your, your learning lab, and we'll get into that a bit later. And in Think Blaze, I was also reading about, sounds fascinating. So we can maybe talk about that a little bit later in the podcast. But I, I always like to start off the, the podcast by asking this simple question of my guests. And that is, what does success mean to you, Yak? Well, I mean, I guess um, uh, success to me is, is really quite simple. I think success is if we manage to uh, do something uh, with purpose and impact. Right? I think that's the main thing that matters for us. And that doesn't necessarily mean that success uh, is always great success, as in like, wow, look at this achievement. There is also success in learning for something in the future that may not have quite worked out, but we were able to sort of gain something from it. Right? So, so I think every... In a, in a way, I, I view every little failure as well as a small form of success that can lead to something greater, as long as we pursued it with um, purpose and impact. Uh, and by purpose and impact, I mean uh, a purpose being something that uh, is important, uh, ideally greater than sort of yourself, so a really large mission that means something to you, uh, an impact, so something uh, that has an influence or uh, an impact on a large scale of users. So while it is, you know, absolutely commendable, for instance, that, uh, you know, we might change the lives of five or 10 people, uh, nothing wrong with that, right? Or even a small community, um, by impact, we're hoping that we can drive something that changes, you know, I mean, I know it sounds cliche, but, you know, changes the world as it were, or sort of, you know, a country or a society. Uh, so I think these, these make each pursuit meaningful. Uh, and I think there's plenty of stories where maybe we didn't have the success we wanted, but we sort of changed an ecosystem or an environment and that in itself became sort of uh, worthwhile. 
It's interesting. I think I, I, that the whole concept of like purpose and impact, I, I use the terminology a lot myself, I guess, in my later career. But what about, you know, 13, 14 year old Yap who's programming, learning to use computers, you know, he wasn't thinking purpose and impact. When, when, when did this, this Yap appear? So I think that uh, uh, purpose and impact uh, sort of in terms of the idea of doing something that had to have purpose probably really only uh, sort of morphed somewhere in the, uh, I would say, maybe um, maybe sort of early 20s or late sort of, uh, sort of maybe sort of, sort of, I guess call it sort of, uh, is it teenage? What do you want to call it? Like 1920? I'm not really sure. <laughs> yeah, I guess <laughs> like, teenage years. Yeah, 19, yeah. 20. I don't know what you what do you really call that, right? Um, because I think um, uh, the so so the first realization I had was you know, when I was writing uh, software back in the sort of sort of good old days of the 80s on the Atari ST, writing effectively what was music software. At the time. Uh, and uh, I, I sort of did what sort of uh, everyone thought was cool, which is you know, we, we sent out what was essentially a form of, a sort of shareware software. Uh, and we would basically get, I would just write the software, I would send it out. There I would have my address uh, to say, hey, if you like the software, you know, give me some money. But I never expected anyone to give me money for my private code, right? I was basically just expecting to do, do this because it's cool, right? It's like a badge of honor. I, I wrote software, I published it, I gave it away for free, and I now can say, please send me money even if you never will. And then some of these people started sending me money, right? And, uh, and I remember that feeling when I got the sort of, sort of checks from people and I didn't have a bank account because I was like, you know, 12 or 13. It was like whatever the age was. And, and I was, um, I was, I was uh, to me, that was the first feeling where I thought there was, you know, and I, didn't, I don't know that I, I obviously can articulate it maybe the way that I can do today, but the sense of an impact or purpose, because first of all, it felt good. But second of all, I also felt that I was making a difference to someone. And it wasn't that I forced him to pay me money. He sent, he sent it to me entirely voluntarily. Right? And that was, again, a concept that was sort of strange because money is precious, it's valuable, and someone gave it to you, even if it was a very small amount, but as a token of appreciation. So that is sort of was generosity, but also appreciation. And so I think that was the part where I started thinking about sort of this feeling that was you know, maybe slightly addictive to do something that was meaningful for others, that created impact, that was purposeful. And maybe the scale was obviously smaller, but it became, as time went on, larger and larger, partially because I had more resources, partially also because I guess I was able to see more and witness more and sort of, you know, quasi mature more, whatever you want to call that, right? Uh, and, and then um, sort, of, uh, sort, of, sort, of, sort of become more ambitious maybe uh, in terms of that. So I think the feeling of impact and purpose was always there, but it was never, articulated until, you know, later in life, uh, when I sort of had a better understanding as to what it is I was trying to do. Sort of a little bit like, you know, self-discovery, which, you know, I, you know it, it's a difficult one. It's something that I think I'm still trying to do. So. Mm. Yeah, I, I think the purpose thing, I, I, I talk to a lot of young people, as I know you do, because I know you mentor and help a lot of young people as well, you know, getting them to understand this concept of purpose. And I'm thinking of our listeners out there. You know, often we say, you know, find purpose and then that will drive you to build a business every day because it's not easy. It's not, you know, it's not as fun as it sounds. And, but if you've got purpose, it kind of makes you do it. It kind of amazes me that the 12, 13 year old you begins to understand that. And I didn't really realize it until I was in my thirties. So, you know, you're way ahead of your time, but I just think back to that. Time. Well, sorry, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No. Yeah. So I think, um, circumstances matter as well. Right. So, uh, I, I didn't grow up in an environment, um, that was, sort of uh, orthodox, right? In the sense that I grew up in Vienna, in Austria, um, uh, to a sort of a musical family, specifically, in particular, my, my mother, who was very driven uh, in that area. But we were very much a minority in what was, you know, a sort of country that had basically barely any Asian, let alone Chinese specifically, right? Mm. Um, and, but I grew up as an Austrian. German is my mother tongue. I'm you know, comfortable with the language. So I was kind of an outsider in. So I had kind of this sort of, I was never really quite part of society, though yet I was, right? So there was kind of this strange tension that I had. And I think that sort of um, sort of obviously colors someone, right? And I think there is an element of sort of how soon you get exposed to that. And I see this with my own children as well. I think it's a form of shelter. 
So I wasn't, you know, I w- it's not that um, I wish to sort of, uh, sort of put sort of pain and suffering to my children at an early age because that's, no parent wants that. On the other hand, if you don't have that, then it's really hard to sort of get into the point of friction to identify who you are. Right? You need that struggle. You need a little bit of that sort of fight. Otherwise, it gets too comfortable. And I think this is part what sort of uh, afflicts the, let's call it, younger generation because we are living in a, a world of plenty compared to our parents' generation. Like my mother, you know, a hardworking person, didn't have time to raise me the way that, frankly, we have time to helicopter parent our children for the most part, especially Hong Kong, right? And so, so, and perhaps elsewhere as well. So, so uh, you know, that kind of attention, I have to always be conscious about how much attention I give my children about certain things and not solving it for them as opposed to having them solve it for themselves. And even then, it's slightly guided and safe. I didn't have any of these safety nets as a child, right? I had to figure everything out myself. I was exposed to all sorts of nice things, but also nasty things, right? Uh, as a minority, racism, struggling, suffering, uh, identity. Uh, and these are things that I think uh, sort of accelerate you. So I, I think that, you know, age was less the issue. It was just that I got exposed to, you know, um, working of the real world, as it were, at an earlier age out of necessity. I lived often by myself at that age. Uh, and again, not because I uh, sort of chose to, but because my, you know, my, my, um, my mother was a traveling artist as a single parent, a single mother. So she had to work in Berlin, she had to work in Paris, and frankly, I lived alone. So I had to cook, I had to do everything myself. And perhaps today you might say, that, that sounds illegal, and it probably was. Yeah. But in the 80s, nobody cared. Uh, and and I, you know, I went to school and I did everything else. And, and actually, frankly, you know, my, my classmates thought it was kind of cool that I was living by myself. Right? So again, these are things that, that sort of, I guess, define you. And, and I think that's, that's part that's part. Um, where I think uh, it comes from, I think. You're, you're answering the questions I'm thinking. It's interesting. You, you just know so much, and I, I know that from knowing you for, over the years. But it's, I'm, I'm thinking about today's time and how you know I watch people, young people on TikTok and these other apps and how they act. Can you imagine, how old is your oldest child? Uh, 15. 15, right. Well, I left home and started a business at 15. And, you know, can you, can you imagine your 15 year old three years ago uh, giving out his address for some stranger to send him a payment? You know, like that, that was what you <laughs> did. Somebody said, Oh, I love this bit of software. And you said, Sure, here's my address. Parents would freak out. You know, like, who is Absolutely. this guy sending you money? <laughs> so does it, does it yeah. mean that? Well, it's- not even that. People would just, the idea that you would give out my address, like, and expose our home and right. sort of all the, you know, it's, it's, it's a completely different way of check, thinking. You know, but like, what is going on right now? You know, like, so, so, so that's an interesting thing, though, because I think a lot of the time, we as entrepreneurs, you know, I, I include myself in this criticism. Is that sometimes like, it's so easy to start a business today. You know, you can just go online and start selling your stuff. And it's so easy. Come on, you no know, easier than we had it. But actually, is it? Well, I think the, there's a few things that are obviously different from a generational standpoint. The first one is, is that our relationship with trust, I feel, back in the quote, 70s and 80s is completely different than what it is today. Uh, meaning that I think that we have a much tighter circle of trust uh, today, which is also challenged uh, in, in a way. I think family values are also different today as well. So the idea, and also I grew up in Austria. I mean, and like Hong Kong, uh, they're both very safe places. So I generally had a high level of trust. Um, and I think the high level of trust is an important element uh, in, in business, uh, which not everyone agrees with, by the way, but I think it's important because only if you have trust can you make strong network connections. Right? But in environments where you have low trust, you have low network connections, you have low network intelligence. That means you can learn, you can gain, you can grow because you're hiding things, right? Like you're, you're treating information as something that is precious or knowledge that you have that someone else doesn't have. You know, you're arbitraging that information to your advantage, uh, uh, which is a little bit, you know, how sort of, it's called it more sort of mercantile business uh, used to be. But, uh, but, um, but I guess maybe the fact that um, I had to sort of, you know, I was, I was trusting at a young age because frankly, I didn't know any better, right? And I didn't have anyone telling me, oh, the world's an ugly place, so just be careful, type of thing. And, and uh, I, I just went out and just literally, like, I gave up my address and said, send me a check. I mean, 
you know, someone could have sent me all sorts of stuff, right? Uh, but they didn't, right? Nobody sent me anything derogatory or nobody sent me something nasty. Maybe today it's different, right? But back then, you know, the idea that that would happen was alien. So, and, and I met a lot of other people who were on these bulletin board systems, which at the time was Gmail and CompuServe, who were equally trusted. Um, so I think I think uh, I think sort of that also is different from today versus tomorrow. So I think, today, I think it know, makes it harder. Does it make it harder for young people to start a business in that way? Then I think the structure uh, is harder because we have a lot more control. Uh, I think the the control being whether it's parents, schools, systems, uh, environments have a controlling sort of um, overhead uh, towards society. To, for children, and also views about what children should be doing, right? So I think I think that's the other problem, right? So we expect a 12-year-old to do this, and a 13-year-old to do this, and a 15-year-old to do this, and then you expect it to go to college, and then you expect to take a job. I mean, why, right? And I think for myself, since I didn't go through that conventional path as, as, as you as well, right? You started your own business at 16, and, you know, I mean, um, you know, I remember I sort of when, when we both had businesses at a young age, uh, we were somewhere in the crazy category to foolish to definitely well whatever we were we were outcasts we were not normal right? uh, and I think I think now this sort of aspect of let's call it quasi normal is more controlling because our parents or because they are generally more affluent and generally have more power shall we say over over the lives of their children um, because of everything that that's there uh, they set that path I mean I remember. Back in the early days of Outblaze in 98, 99, um, I was interviewed by parents to hire their children, which was ridiculous. But that was really the case because they were like, oh, why should they join the startup? I need to, like, yeah, I was, I was like, what? I'm, I'm, I'm talking to mom and dad, and I, I well, mom actually, generally. Uh, and, uh, and on top of it, I would get calls from mom about why is my child not back for dinner? Because it was in Hong Kong. Uh, young employees and, and staff typically lived with their family until you know much later. Uh, so all these cultural aspects uh, come into play, and I think hurts independence, and and therefore I do think uh, different kind of challenges um, for for sort of uh, growing a business. That having said all that, though, I think it is easier for people to start a business because it's also become more acceptable to start a business as a uh, entrepreneur. So net on net. I think uh, it's still easier, uh, but I think um, breaking out of that mold um, has uh, has different consequences. It's almost like if you're a startup now, it's cool, which by the way, 10 years ago even wasn't cool, right? So I think that's an evolution that's happened. I think now we're getting a little bit of a, too much of a, I, I want to start a startup um, and um, w- without giving it necessarily the, the wider thought. Yeah, there seems to be, uh, a collision now though between I guess university life and being an entrepreneur there's still if you've gone to the right university it makes a huge difference to your life if you start a company there's a high chance it will fail and you'll end up with nothing you know almost like the two bets are, are leaned against each other I still think certainly you know having lived in Hong Kong for a long time and then coming outside of that bubble and living in England there's still startup world is still frowned upon actually it's only the successful people that are given kudos and respect those that are trying to make it are still seen and I, I hear it quite often you know when are you going to get a real job you know when when's this yeah. stuff and that, that's what I find very interesting about your background actually I, you know reading through all the things that have been written about you and all the things that you've done it's not only impressive but you know you have dipped in and out of working for people you know you, you work for AT&T to pay the bills for your cyber city business you know that's a unique thing you know how, how did you I mean I guess I've got two questions one is do you think entrepreneurs are born or bred and and what was your experience like you know working for companies and coming back out and working for yourself how did, how did that play out so yeah, I, I, working for AT and T made it very clear that I'm, I think, fairly incompatible for you for a larger organization. That was the first big realization. It was probably um, um, the the only time where I sort of wore a suit and tie every day to work because it was mandated. Uh, but it was a good experience. Um, but I think um, the the thing about sort of maybe the first experience within AT and I think what it did tell me was a little bit about structure and organization. Uh, something that is very difficult, frankly, to learn even at school because, you know, they'll show you org charts, but you don't feel it because you don't understand the mechanics. You don't understand that there's politics or that there's people issues or there's 
sort of emotions involved. Like these things are not typically discussed. Uh, so you, you feel and see that environment. And in my case, I was unusual at at and at the time because I was quite young. Uh, I think maybe 22 or 23, I don't remember, but I was fairly young uh, when I was working at AT&T for only one year. Um, but because I had set up an internet service provider uh, called Hong Kong Online earlier, which was one of Hong Kong's first ISPs, I had unique knowledge about networking protocols, which was rare at the time. Uh, and so I was in a very senior position, but at a relatively young age. Um, in some cases, uh, sort of ranking, sort of, and again, this was my first exposure to rank, right? Which is like, wait a second, it mattered what band you were, right? These are things that I just sort of like, what, right? So, so these are all things that, that sort of I learned about what, what, what value systems people had. Um, so know, anyone listening, just, just anyone listening, by the way, to this, I mean, that's talking about the ranking system, you know, how popular your product is in the world compared to other people's products in the world, right? So the ranking systems still... Well, there's one ranking system, but then the other ranking system within an organization is what rank are you within the organization? And it matters, right? So oh, yeah, that you true. were sort of a C band or D band or E band or whatever band it was, right? And, and, and it, it, it was a label. Right? It was a label to aspire to. It was the ultimate um, sort of control mechanism of a corporation for that people. Right? So, which in itself essentially boxed you in, which to me was a frustrating part. But because I was already kind of the weird one, because I was younger and I was, didn't have the same constraints, um, I, sort of, I think I got to see a perspective where I wasn't caught up because I, I never considered it a long-term career. Because as you were saying earlier, I was taking this job to pay the bills for what I thought was important, which was to run CyberCity. And CyberCity was basically a free email uh, hosting services provider. And in, in, I think it's a good example um, of sort of how I viewed impact and purpose. I, I thought I could, so it was really hard making money as an ISP. So I thought I would make some money selling advertising. This was in 95. Okay, so, <laughs> so yeah. like nobody was buying advertising. So, so it was a perfect example time, of sort of too early uh, online, right? Um, but I had, at that point, um, close to 300,000 users, which was a large number uh, in Asia using the service. And what I recognized was that people were waiting for hours to upload their content on the website. Right? So they were like waiting for hours, and they were grateful. Right? I mean, just imagine, right? You're waiting, a, you're, sort of, you're going into a store, and you're waiting for hours to get your burger. You say, thank you for that burger. That was great after three hours. So just, just the thinking around that is like, so, so I recognized that there was something important there um, about self-expression. The reason why I couldn't make any money is because all of my users were kids or young or university <laughs> kids, right? So, so, so they, were, they, they didn't have any money, so I provided the service for free. Um, and it was important for me to continue the service, but I had to pay the bills. And that is where, the, you know, through a, a good mutual contact, uh, Tony Corrado, he basically, you know, um, he, he said, hey, you know, we could use someone like yourself. And, and I said, sure, you know, I, I'll go join AT&T, sell my soul for maybe a little while to keep it going. And that was possible because of what I thought was more important for cybersecurity. So I didn't do it because I wanted to have a better job or a position or rent a nice place. I did it because there were hundreds of thousands of people who were relying on a service that gave them a form of self-expression at that time. It was basically like an early blog service, but in the 90s. Right? Um, so, so I think, and again, you know, that, you know, I never thought about sort of, you know, sort of marriage or sort of, you know, like having a sort of a nicer place to live or sort of, you know, all these things. It was important that, you know, the people who were using the service, who depended on it, were, were getting what they wanted because I thought it had impact and purpose. Right? That, that, was, that was why I took that job. Well, it's interesting um, how that plays out. Was you know, one year at AT and T that that were you not tempted for a second? Was there not that you know one moment six months in where you you know you've got the regular paycheck and you're like you know what I've been I've been saying this is the wrong way to go for so long, but actually this ain't so bad. Well, I think the thing was that um, what was hard for for me at AT and T was I couldn't move things because there were a lot of things that I thought they should do. And I think, uh, and, and, and they couldn't for very structural reasons. Uh, so that was one, that was one frustration. Uh, but the other one, I think, uh, which was also really important was that, uh, obviously the opportunity started to knock when, when CyberCity got acquired. And, uh, 
because you know back then the dot com boom started coming up and and uh, and I saw an opportunity and of course that was the start of when I started Outblaze. Right after with some of the learnings and a little bit of the money that I, I made, uh, so that was the other thing. Um, it, you know, and I guess I didn't think of it quite that time because that time I was more thinking about building sort of product and the next thing. Also, remember, you know, I'm single. I don't have any commitments. I, you know, like, you know, it doesn't really matter, right? That's the other thing. I didn't have a restriction. And I think young entrepreneurship has that one major advantage, which is you, if you're willing to dare and risk it all, what you're losing is very little, right? I mean, the reality is that if I lost everything in my 20s, I would have lost very little <laughs> in contrast. Whereas, frankly, as you get older, you lose much more. And you have more responsibility. You might have a family, you might have a mortgage, you might have children, maybe elderly parents, right? All these pressures start building on you, which start to create an invisible box around your movements. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why, in some cases, young entrepreneurs have an advantage uh, because they're not as restricted, right? I think that's 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 part of it. So anyway, I just moved moved ahead and said, look, this is better. Uh, because I, I can make the impact and purpose I wanted to do, and um, which I couldn't do uh, over over at AT and T. But it's important also to note that I didn't plan. It, it wasn't like I had a plan. I'm going to be in AT and T for one year and then I go. No, that was not how it went. It was circumstance. I was there to fulfill this, to set it up, because I believed in it. And then serendipity brought me to a web of new opportunities. And I decided to just move into that opportunity, right? That's, that's how it went. It was, there was no master plan, you know, per se, uh, in terms of, you know, where things might end up, you know, five years down the road. It's, it's interesting because I, I do see so many people that should be, I think, entrepreneurs, but they get caught inside companies. I mean, these days, people like Google and Facebook, the packages they offer programmers and, and probably talent like you at a young age, it's so hard to say no and follow through on Cyber City, right? I mean, it's, it's, they get drawn in. Do you, do you think that's true? Yes, I think it's, it's very true. However, I think there is also a lot more people, like the pool of people willing to do it, it does also expand, right? So I think what happens a lot is people go work at a large organization for Google for one or two years. Um, and then they sort of recognize that they want to do this new business and maybe they should do it themselves. What's different from sort of back then versus now is that there are venture capitalists out there who are prepared to pay a good amount of investment money for you, particularly in, in the U.S. Uh, and in parts of Asia as well, who would back your story, uh, who would give you some money to do that, which really was unheard of back when we were building businesses in the technology side. Uh, and so that makes it easier to switch because you can be, so to speak, master of your own destiny uh, and not necessarily take too much of a sacrifice in your pay in order to build a business. So that is the shift that's changed. The other thing is that when you think about value of equity versus labor, it's clear that equity has been the winner throughout, right? I mean, you know, if you, if you made an investment across multiple companies, including even companies that maybe you were sort of working for, let's say, um, uh, versus uh, uh, sort of, you know, just the labor salary you would have made, uh, in most cases, equity would have won out significantly. And I think that's another part that, um, that has changed that. If you think logically, if you really think logically, it is much better to be an entrepreneur uh, from a sort of long-term perspective or to take equity in what you're working on that is promising rather than take a job and be there for 30 years with a certain guaranteed path. Because the combination of inflation and capital and labor and everything around that essentially means you'll be working for the rest of your life and maybe not have quite as much as you had hoped for to have a comfortable sort of, uh, sort of, uh, sort of uh, uh, continued um, retirement or life or whatever you want to do, right? That promise no longer exists uh, and actually hasn't really existed for the last maybe even three decades but people still persist in that mode. But I think there's still a perception, isn't there, that a job is safe and doing a, your own business is risky, which I think maybe short term is true, long term definitely isn't. But I, it's interesting. I always think about the listeners to this podcast and trying to inspire people to start a business. You know, it, it's getting them to understand that actually starting your own business when you're young is not only, as yet saying, crucial, but I think over time it's much more valuable i think you know we're talking financially here in the last few minutes but i think before that you know what what yet saying about ultimately you know 
purpose and, and impact. You can't change AT&T's purpose. They, they've got their track. That's that, right? So, you know, that's why I think your experience is so relevant. I, I, I wanted to just go back a second. So do you think entrepreneurs are born or bred? I actually, I actually think that, um, so I think that it's a, it's a, it's a loaded question, right? Because, um, so I have this strong view, uh, and I think it, entrepreneurship comes in multiple bundles, right? It's not just, are you driven to build a business, but are you sort of creative and are you a strong divergent thinker? And my view on this, uh, which is shared by a number of other people as well, is that actually everyone is divergent and creative. Right. So it's kind of, I think the question is somewhat related to is, are you born creative or are you made to be creative? Right? Uh, it's kind of the same question to me. Uh, and uh, there, you know, I think everyone is in fact born creative, but uh, what happens is, is that because we go through conventional education, because we are taught certain things, because we are within the environments that we are, that slowly over time, um, you know, our creativity is sort of killed and dropped out of us. And only a small percentile of people uh, actually um, sort of have uh, sort of sort of are succeeding sort of sort of in spite of the system rather than because of the system. And there are a number of studies out there that that would suggest that. And that's actually an area that I'm quite passionate about. Um, so there's a study by uh, sort of um, Jarvis and Land, um, uh, which is basically a diversion thinking test that they created for NASA originally. So that NASA scientists, uh, and you can Google and search it up, uh, sort of NASA, so not the sort of if you uh, sort of want to hire a NASA scientist, they go through this test to see how divergent a thinker you are. Because you know when you send someone into the moon, um, it's never been done before, so you can't exactly say, well, you know, let's run these scenarios that were proven. So you have to have really creative engineers and thinkers to solve the problem, right? So they designed this test for Na NASA and made a similar version for children and followed them from the ages of five to 15, and then gave adults uh, who were 21 the same test. Uh, and uh, surprisingly, or maybe not even, the ones who were five-year-olds, basically almost every child was a divergent thinker. They scored incredibly creatively. Uh, and then by the time they were eight years of age, it didn't just drop 10 or 20%, it dropped like 70%. So they were already at the 30 percent. And by the time they were 15 percent, 15 years of age, um, I don't remember the number of, of heart, but it was terrible. It was like maybe 10 percent or 8 percent or 12 percent. Anyway, it was a disappointingly low figure, and the adults scored 2 percent. Yeah. So um, now, if you think of it this another way, uh, what is the ratio of people who become entrepreneurs in this world? Well, it's also a low single digit percentage. Uh, and why is it that entrepreneurs are often the ones who somehow don't quite fit in the box? Because they're not caught in the system. Because they're not part of the sort of, sort of let's call it, sort of conventional environment. Right? They're outsiders, right? I mean, Silicon Valley, the vast majority of startup founders and CEOs and executives there um, are, interestingly enough, not from California, but they're from all over the place, right? So diversity is important, but also because they were outsiders coming in. And so I think, uh, to me, if you're able to improve, and that's the basis of what we want to do at the Learning Lab, if you can improve the funnel at the, at the bottom, at the young age, and sort of make a percentile of them is sort of become, stay creative, um, where by the time they hit 15, maybe it's not a sort of, you know, low percentage, but maybe a slightly higher percentage. And then by the time they are adults, even if the two percentile becomes only 4% of people who are creative and divergent, actually what you've done is you've doubled the creative energy of that cohort because it's a doubling of that. So you don't even need to have, you know, um, sort of a 50% conversion. You don't need every child that was five years old to remain creative up until their 20s. You really just need to make sure that the top of the funnel is not whittled down as fast as it is. Um, and has been so far. So I think that to me is the sort of creativity slash entrepreneurship. Uh, so if you can sort of preserve that creative energy at a young age and don't not lose that playfulness energy and, and sort of that drive that we have, because curiosity is inherent in our children, right? You see it. 
But then the you know, teacher tells you, you can't do that, or you must follow it this way. There are multiple examples. One example from, which sort of was my wake up call from my eldest child when he was, I forget how old, maybe six or seven. He, he came one day to uh, my, my sort of a bedroom. I was sort of in bed with my wife and sleeping and was super tired. I would forget if it was nine or 10, 10 a.m. in the morning. And he said, like, Daddy, I'm bored. 10 a.m. Nothing to do. And I was like, oh, just go play. Just, just, just do something, right? And he sat there. Like he was waiting for instructions. And I was like, holy shit, what just happened here, right? Uh, you know, this is like, you know, my son who is, you know, smart and bright. And we all think our kids are great. But you know what? Just go play, right? Just go outside and do something. And you couldn't. And, and that to me was like, what happened here? Right? And that sort of was the beginning of sort of another purpose that I went down to sort of find out what happened to, you know, you grow in an environment that is not restrictive, at least we think, uh, and somehow you are sort of unable to take an action without being given orders at, you know, not even six or seven years of age. And so I think this is a problem that affects all of our children in one form or another for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and and uh, and so I think entrepreneurs are a long-winded way to say I think entrepreneurs are, are born. I think we all have the capacity to be entrepreneurs, but we are um, we are taught not to. I love the answer. It's the most thorough answer I've had to that question. And um, not that I want to live in a bubble, but I I, com- I completely feel the same way. It's interesting. I watch my two and a half year old play, and I can see his imagination is just mind-blowingly amazing and i i do see it with my brother's children who are all older because i had children later in life how that slowly gets squeezed out of them so is this what dalton learning lab that you started in 2017 is is focused on is it trying to keep that 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 divergent piece uh, yes so divergent thinking um sort of uh, uh sort of strong emphasis on empathy and sort of design thinking uh, these are things that we really wanted to sort of create an environment where children can sort of unleash their creativity. I know it sounds super cliche, right? But I think I think the idea being really sort of not to just talk about it, but find ways in which we can sort of allow the freedom in, in sort of different ways for children to uh, express their creativity uh, and make it fun and interesting. So we've done, you know, things like, you know, our, our support here, our music project came from there. We, we did them sort of interesting stuff on robotics and, you know, and, and the thing is, is that it's not, it's run quasi-social enterprise like. Uh, so some of our programs that we developed, for instance, we developed an AI module and a blockchain module from scratch and we give it away for free. We put it out for open source. And, and someone the someone and will send you a check, you know. And maybe someone You're just repeating check, history right? over and over again. <laughs> Creating value. <laughs> And, uh, but I, I, for everyone listening, I'll put the link to the Dalton Learning Lab in the comments of this uh, podcast so you, you can also uh, learn about what uh, Yat is doing there. I, I, I'm fascinated by it. And so, you know, it's, it's really exciting. And Thank someone you. with a young child, I'm sure a lot of listeners out there have, have children and, and they're wondering how to ensure that those children stay on that creative path. Because I think it's interesting too. I mean, there's an element of me, um, I sometimes envy my younger brother because he's grew up in the same town his whole life and he's very happy there. And he, you know, just outside Cambridge and he, I tell him about Hong Kong and he's like, oh, sounds too busy to me. And he's very happy in his town. But I sometimes regret knowing so much about the world because now I love bits of everywhere a bit like you were saying earlier about traveling part of me worries that if you're a divergent child and you retain it there's an element of like you're not going to be happy in the world that's created under the 1984 George George Orwell system right which is you know go like you're saying go to university and 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 do this follow this system and then you'll be a lawyer and you'll get a regular paycheck for the rest of your life and there you go life's good right you become an oddball which is hard right being an entrepreneur is I know a lot of people listening out there want to become entrepreneurs you know it's not easy we're not this podcast is not here to tell you it's easy this podcast is here to try and help you get some insights how to do it but it's not easy right well i think the commentary uh that that, that's sort of the famous phrase i don't know who said it but you know ignorance is bliss ignorance is bliss right is that isn't it fair you know more kids will be less ignorant uh and, and they'll want more from from the system that wants to push them back into the box but i think the problem right now is is that um it is impossible to be ignorant um, in a way, because so much information. And so I think this is something where maybe that could have worked, you know, sort of a couple of generations ago. But today it doesn't work because the amount of information that's flowing at us 
you know, both good and also bad, is so dramatic that actually the only defense is to fight ignorance. I don't think it can be any more a case of, I choose not to listen. Because ultimately, as humans, we are influenced. Mm. So now we need to find ways in which we can process. And that is not a skill that is really taught well. Uh, and so that's frankly why fake news and all this kind of stuff can travel the way it does, because we are susceptible. We, you know, the human mind has been hacked, right, in that sense. Uh, and and uh, and to choose to sort of say, look, I just choose to sort of hide away in my spot. At this point, given the fact that we are a connected society, I feel like we have a connected responsibility to handle it. And for those people who say, I don't, I don't want to, then maybe you're not part of the connected society and you are not a citizen of the world. I know, again, it sounds terrible, terribly cliche, but we are now one unit. And I think the reason why we have seen the progress that we have, the innovation that we've seen, is because we have such a broad sort of network intelligence that connects everyone. Uh, we've all benefited from it somehow. Uh, it's kind of impossible to shut up. It's like saying, you know what? I don't like the internet. Um, it's like giving people too many ideas about revolution or different ideas of democracy. Let's turn it off. Let's see how that works. Right? But, but there, is an, element, that. there is an element of that in middle America. I mean, that's why you know Trump got elected. There's an element of like, let's stop progress. Let's stop technology taking our jobs. You know, that, 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 so there's a, there is an ignorance in the system. That, I mean, I, I can even talk from my own family, my, my own niece, who I love very much. She listens to these podcasts just to say I love her very much. But, you know, she gets through the algorithms on her social network, all the failure stories of all the startups. And she's, you know, I'm telling her to do a company of her own and she's so clever and she could do this and she do that. She's like, oh, I just read about WeWorks and how they failed. And I just read about this and why they failed, you know, and, and they live within a bubble. The system is delivering up the reinforcement people are looking, looking for based on their present belief systems, right? So is, is all that technology, is. in fact, not necessarily benefiting those that, you know, aren't, aren't divergent? Well, I think, um, so I think there's a couple of things here. One, yes, I think um, it depends on your upbringing. But I think the, you know, the clash right now is that technology is sort of this Russian pool of data information that requires you to have, I guess, a strong element of sort of diversion thinking and processing power really to sort of be able to handle it, uh, and it's not how you were sort of how you were sort of raised or, or grown up to sort of have all these multiple sources and that you had to analyze that type of stuff. That's so so it's incompatible, right? And I think you know we we went through a phase where with you know the augmentation of technology and sort of society and human living, I think the closest thing we've seen was with the, with the mobile phone. Right? The mobile phone was an augmentation of that. Suddenly we had effectively superpowers, right? If you compare ourselves to the human 100 years ago, we are superhuman, at least in our intelligence, because I can get data, I can know stuff, I can do stuff that they can't do. As far as they're concerned, we're all supermen, right, or superwomen. However, now we've gone to a point where technology and the machine, frankly, has overwhelmed us, and we're seeing a wider gap, in my view, of the generations who are, it's clashing, but I think, I think they're clashing of generations where people are sort of mixing uh, and clashing with their own worldviews about where things need to be. Uh, and, uh, and, and the confirmation biases that we get that social media and the algorithm delivers to us, you know, was not something we were never exposed to. Right? And suddenly we get that and we're comfortable with the echo chamber that we're receiving and it's reinforced and then it's the spread what we're seeing today. And I think it's very difficult to teach or try to educate uh, sort of people with entrenched views to change their minds. Uh, and, and I think this is the thing about if you can uh, sort of maintain divergent thinking at a young age and maintain their sort of openness to new ideas because they remain divergent in their approaches, then as they get older, they're less susceptible to being hacked that way because they're willing to take 50 different viewpoints and see what is the best path as opposed to, well, it's only this way. Uh, which is, you know, a classic convergent approach. And, uh, and if it doesn't fit that box, then I don't really want to go there. Um, I, think, I, think, uh, I think this is the, whether you want to call it failing or issue, um, sort of that, the clash that's caused by what technology has offered in this sort of exponential pace that it has uh, and, and the way that we were raised and brought up. Yeah, so which makes it tricky as parents. I, I think about it from my own son, you know, how, how to make sure I don't accidentally put him into a school that then accidentally 
slowly but surely takes away that natural creativity that's there. So it's, it's a real problem. I'm, I'm, I'm going to study more what you're doing at Dalton Learning Lab. I think it's a, a fascinating point. Do you think not having a father in your life was a good thing? Do you, how do you feel about that? Uh, I think that, I don't know if it's a good thing, right? I mean, I think, um, certainly I'd like to think that um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully a good, something positive on my children's experience, right? So, so I, I would imagine that having a father is, is, is good. But I think the difference maybe is also, it depends on what kind of, um, you know, relationship you have with your children, right? So what, um, back then, certainly the relationship I have with my mother and, uh, and, and, and as I observed with others is that we, we were not as open about sort of our feelings and things like that. You, know, you don't talk about that type of stuff, right? This is like, you know, go to school and do your work and you know, whatever, right? And, you know, and it's the odd, I love you type of thing, but it's not really, you don't go deep into, into, into the issues. Uh, whereas, um, the relationship I have with my children is much closer. Of course, time will tell whether it's successful or not. But, you know, I feel like I can, they can talk to me and confide in me on things that, um, almost like a friend, right? So the relationship our parents had with us was very hard to think, right? You would listen to your mom or your, or your dad. Uh, and uh, there was really no argument of, wait, wait, hold on. Really? I don't agree with you. I'm mean, certainly not as a, as a, as a 10 year old. Today, it's very much because of the information you flow as well. They would know things that I don't know just because they have the internet or they have stuff or they're, they're, they're focused on an area and I can't be an expert in everything, right? Whereas, you know, generations ago, parents frankly knew everything or at least had more knowledge or supposed to have more knowledge, right? Just like the teachers. They're supposed to know more than you. That is not true anymore. So I think the relationship is being reconfigured uh, to one where it's more one on a peer level. And that is very, and that is a very, uh, I think, dramatic uh, sort of approach, because imagine us as children approaching our own parents as peers is unheard of. But today, in the virtual world, for instance, you are peers, or maybe even inferior, because my children will kick my butt in video games any day, despite the fact that we are in the video game industry, because they play it and they're much better at it, right? And when we play online games, they will show me the books and they will tell me about strategies. And, and, and uh, in that sense, they are superior because in the virtual world, physical strength or age does not matter. Um, and, uh, you know, my daughter has more followers than me on Instagram. Not to say that that means anything because I don't have a lot of followers anyway, but it's just, you know, it's like, oh, you only have like X, X hundreds of followers. I have like half the school following me, like they're much cooler. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, the, the point being is, is that they have points of there reference. There we go, a new ranking yeah, system. New ranking, that's right. That's right. But they have points of reference that are just um, sort of no longer, is it, am I, are we obvious alphas in, in, in the classic sense? Yeah, so true. Well, I, 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 there's a couple of things. I, I, I'm this uh, podcast. I, basically, I could I could talk to you forever. I just I find your insights fascinating. There's a few things I'm thinking now about my niece that's listening. I'd like just to quickly talk about your exits. You know, I, I think you know building a company up and selling it is kind of everyone's dream. And I I think that even for myself, you know, having actually achieved that and done that, uh, I, I sometimes have regrets. You know, I, I sold a company I actually loved to PwC. And in a way, uh, part of me is gone forever and got absorbed into that machine. Now you've, you've built and sold companies quite a few times. I think I counted at least five times that you've done this. So you know, one, you know, any, any particular story that stands out as a cautionary tale and, and, and two, any insights for anybody out there that perhaps is building a business and, and would love to sell it? Um, you know, I, I think it's really, um, I don't know that there's so much as a sort of, uh, sort of definite sort of answer as to sort of selling a business. I think the idea of selling a business or building a company so that you can sell the business, I think is already at start, maybe a difficult approach. I, you know, when, 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 when I would think of building a company, I never think of the exit, um, which I think is maybe counterintuitive from a VC standpoint, but I'm not building it for the VCs. I'm building it for, you know, my impact and purpose. Right? Uh, and so, you know, and, and if you have the impact and purpose, something will come, which may not necessarily be monetary. It may even be indirect, right? Uh, it's a little bit like open source. Uh, you know, you build some cool stuff and maybe, you know, the, the code that was used uh, in itself isn't the sort of 
you know, that was shared across isn't maybe specifically uh, giving you financial rewards. But then from that code, something else came about because someone else saw it and used it and sort of made something sort of incredible out of that, right? So, and then through that serendipity and through that approach, opportunity will arise, right? Because, because of what you're trying to build. So I think first sort of thinking of it in terms of an exit, I think is, at least from my perspective, very hard because um, that means you're kind of building a business to make money, which, you know, fundamentally as a sort of, um, uh, sort of sustainable business is healthy and necessary. But if that's the reason you're doing the business, then there's always apparently a better way to make money, right? Like, you know, like I could make more money trading stocks maybe, or I could make more money gambling on horses or whatever, right? There, there could be other ways in which you could make money, but that's the purpose. Um, so as so I said, I think, I think that's, that's difficult. Now, when it comes to the exit, if you are uh, sort of building a business with purpose and impact, then the exit opportunities, at least in my experience, have come to us as a result because we are out there. We are sort of, you know, talking about it. We are sort of passionately talking about it uh, because we really believe in it and we think it's going to change the world in X, Y, and Z ways. And eventually, if, you know, you're good at it and, uh, and it, it sort, of, sort of resonates with people, they come to you and say, hey, we should work together. We should sort of do something together. We should whatever. And through that approach, um, you know, then opportunities arise, whether this is an exit or whether it's an IPO or whatever that may be for strategic investment. That has been very much sort of, I guess you could say, um, how things have worked out for us, um, at, least, at least so far. Does it sometimes clash with you as an investor at this point? Because if someone just building a business and they're there forever, does, does it change your perspective at all when, when looking at it from that lens? What do you mean there forever? For, from from an exit perspective, um, if you're investing uh, in a business today, I mean, I saw, for example, I saw a story on you where you'd invested in a business because I know you incubate and support a lot of startups that, you know, that the kind of headline was we invested in this business and then we sold it to, I, for, I forget the name of the company now, but it, it was sold in S Silicon Valley. Um, you know, so that was almost the metric. We invested in a company, it did well and we sold it. That is definitely how investors talk, right? And that's how people, a lot of people out there get build up more funds and are able to raise more money. So is, is exit important from an investor perspective and does it clash when you're, when you're reviewing who to invest in? Does yeah, the, so, I mean, we're not professional investors, I think, in the sense that, you know, um, I mean, I guess you might call us sophisticated investors, but we're not professional investors in the sense that we don't run a fund, right? So we don't have, so whatever money we invest is either sort of out of balance sheet or sort of, you know, my money or whatever, right? So we don't have the same restraints. If I was running a VC professionally and I had like a seven year or a 10 year sort of window or whatever, then I may have to look at things differently. And I may have to look at the opportunities as to where I thought um, an exit could happen. That would be part of the business model. So absolutely, if that was what I was doing, then yes. Um, but that's not what we're doing, right? So which allows me to make investments that have long-term horizons. I think this is, this is actually a very important point. I want the listeners to pick up on this point because there's different types of investors and there's people that like, yeah, who will invest in your business because he feels he can help or, and, or he sees potential in your purpose and impact and he'll be with you for the long term. And then of course there's the fund structured VCs, which are running things to also help you do well, but ultimately they need an exit. So they might want to hear an exit story, right? That's definitely going to be an issue. I mean, I noticed you know, in your past, I, I, you, got, you got investment from PCCW. I'm sure that was a strategic investment, right? So that's another type of investment for people to understand. That's correct. Um, but I think when we got that investment from PCCW, this was in 1999, and those were some pretty crazy days. And I think um, uh, times have changed because there wasn't any like VCs per se, so it was, it was different. But strategic investors is important because uh, sometimes, like again, uh, corporate, let's call it corporate investors, also have a long-term horizon because they look at it more in terms of how it impacts their business, how it can sustain what they're doing, or how it could be a window of innovation that they themselves might not be able to do, and that's the reason they would do the investment. So the, and, and, and the need to do an exit is also not important. In fact, it is more important to learn uh, or sort of co collaborate than it is to sort of make a financial uh, financial gain because they don't have that mandate. So it is different. But you do need the VCs uh, that can uh, sort of do it for the money 
because frankly, most of them do that. And that's the reason why there's an ecosystem of, of investors and startups that can flourish. If there wasn't that purpose, then, you know, yeah, then there wouldn't be enough startup capital flowing around, right? So I think I think these are these are these are very important um, sort of elements to bring success to to any kind of uh, sort of ecosystem. Well, I've, I've got a couple more questions to wrap up because I know it's very late there in Hong Kong for you, coming up to one no o'clock in the morning, I think. So um, thank you so much for giving the listeners your time and, and for, for sharing your story. A couple of things I wanted to ask. Uh, first of all, you, you mentioned in a previous story about the 2000 crash when, when you know everything went to shit. We'll probably get that bleeped out by... Uh, by Facebook, but we, um, you know, there was a scary time for everybody who was involved in the, the, the dot-com era. Then, of course, you just mentioned um, PCCW bought into your business at that time. But you mentioned something I found interesting, which was you said during that time it was a good time to hire people, and it made me think about where we're at today with the coronavirus and you know and the devastation that's causing all the people getting laid off. Do you have a similar view mm-hmm. now that the, 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 there is some good from yeah, all this? Yeah, so no. Um, coronavirus is a very different. Uh, a coronavirus is a very different crisis as compared to maybe financial crisis of 2008 or um, sort of you know dot com bust uh, or even SARS. I think they're quite different. And even the reason SARS, why is different. yes, I think it's different because one of the things that's happened now is um, unlike unlike um, the other previous crises where there was a macro effect for every segment that was affected for the most part. In coronavirus, um, sort of fortunately and unfortunately to some degree, uh, technology has benefited from it. Right? So, for instance, in our in our business, uh, in our video gaming business, um, our traffic is way up uh, because of the fact that everyone is at home playing video games. Right. So, we, and, and in fact, if you look at video game stats, or if you look at social media stats, or if you're looking at Netflix or whatever it is, they really gain uh, and are creating new habits of social interaction. I mean, you know, look at Zoom, right? <laughs> you know, uh, or any kind of video hangout that happens uh, or sort of, you know, companies that provide services in that space are exploding in growth. Right? And, uh, and uh, you know, it was the same for remote learning and ed tech and, and video learning. So there are, there are winners in this space. Uh, and, uh, and, and they're much broader because we already have that infrastructure in place uh, to take advantage of it, which was not the case back when the dot-com bust happened or when the previous sort of crisis has happened. So technology had not yet become so interwoven in our life that it was a viable alternative to continue to do business. Uh, therefore, we were all somehow equally affected. And even though you were an engineer working in tech, you would have the same financial struggles. This is not true for coronavirus uh, in all cases. Uh, therefore, uh, you know, hiring engineers today is in fact potentially even harder because reskilling someone uh, who is not an engineer to become an engineer or someone who's not in technology to go into technology is is not straightforward. Uh, it's doable, but it takes time. Uh, and and so I think uh, if anything, you know, so I always view that the sort of the technology adoption was in, inevitable. It's just a question, not 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 a question of sort of sort of if just when. And coronavirus accelerated that. And we just don't have enough people uh, uh, that, that sort of can sort of fulfill that. So I think there's, there's going to be a squeeze in, in tech talent uh, as a result of that. Because even large corporations who are now like, okay, we can't have retail anymore. We can't do this, or we can't do what we used to do. We've got to do the only other thing that makes sense. Technology, right? Whether it's selling online or whatever, guess what they're doing? They're hiring tech talent, right? Mm. Uh, more so than it did before. Uh, there's a funny meme that went around about sort of, sort of, you know, what led to your sort of digital transformation? Was it your CEO? Was it your CTO? It was COVID and everyone checked for that, right? Yeah, because I saw that. It's so true. Was it COVID's been the biggest impact in p- pioneering and pushing forward your innovation. A lot of people caught Correct. misfooted, right? And now they've got no choice. Because Amazon was doing a lot of, to the high streets. It was already devastating. It was just doing it very slowly. This has just accelerated, in my view, what was already happening in many regards. And I think what's happening now is um, that people are seeing, oh, wait, hold on a second. Actually, and not for everyone, right? Like, you know, um, my daughter misses her friends and wants to sort of hang out with everyone and sort of wants to have the social connection. But for my son, it's like, hey, you know what? Learning on at home and sort of doing this is actually kind of cool as well. And I'm comfortable with that. And before that wasn't even a choice. And now suddenly it's a choice. And maybe I prefer that. 
So there will be a space, for instance, where children who prefer to learn online might even choose to learn online maybe 50% of the time or 90% of the time, and then a percent, and then go to school you know, for social and other interactions. Whereas before, it was mandatory that they go every day. And what does that do to all the infrastructure that was set up? You know, forcibly, millions of teachers now know how to use Zoom or Hangouts or Meet, right? You know, imagine telling our schools, you know, six months ago, oh, you got to start learning how to do video conferencing. Like, what? Nah, don't have time for that. We're too busy. It's just too much work. I got to grade the homework. I can't do that. And now they all know how to use Zoom. Um, to top that off, you have, you know, possibly tens, if not hundreds of millions of children that are also completely comfortable now, um, you know, to learn remotely, online, or video. So all of these things are there, and they're not going to go away. Uh, so, and again, I'm not expecting that everyone will only learn online, but sort of that pace of adoption, which was maybe meant to be, let's call it 10% growth, just became like, you know, 300% growth. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've spoken to a lot of parents who are homeschooling right now, and, and actually it sounds like one of the benefits is they're able to help their children learn. They're getting the one-to-one attention that kids can't get in a classroom. And it was interesting when I was looking at schooling for my own son, you know, basically there was always this feeling that if I did homeschooling, which I did consider, you're weird. You know, it'd be very strange to do homeschooling, even though there is a whole social element to homeschooling where you can still see kids and so on. But you'd be the weird one. Yeah. Now it's becoming almost like a mainstream idea to homeschool, right. uh, which is which is fascinating. Look, I, 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 I basically I'm going to get you back on the show, uh, if that's OK, because I've got about 50 other questions. But I'm just going to wrap up, too, because as this is the Good Luck podcast, I just wanted to quickly get your insight on luck and how you think it plays a part in business. Um, so... On the topic of luck, there is a, there's a quote that I really like um, by sort of the Roman philosopher Seneca. Uh, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. I think so far, when I look at this sort of, sort of uh, personal journey, I think that is probably as close to the truth as I can sort of imagine. Meaning that, uh, you know, we all have sort of, you know, luck is chance, right? Uh, misfortune is chance as well, you know, whether this is COVID or whether this is SARS or whatever, right? But um, when you have conviction in something and you're preparing for something, um, when the opportunity comes and you're ready to strike, because maybe there is the opportunity that's come, but you're not ready because you haven't built the infrastructure. And that comes from the idea of having a vision. Right? So whether this was our belief that the internet was going to be big when I started an internet service provider in 93. Right? Now, that was kind of early. And, you know, it probably took, I don't know, let's call it maybe really um, 10 years to really say, oh, actually, it is big, <laughs> as opposed to a fantasy. But in those 10 years, I built skills, I developed, I grew, I did things on the Internet. So that by the time when you know, the Internet actually was big, I was ready for it, as opposed to, oh, wow, look, the Internet is big, let's rush in like everyone else. Right? Um, so it comes with that conviction. We were prepared. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we were, you know, the timing was right, but, you know, uh, and the luck element was that, oh, look, the internet actually is a real thing. And, you know, people do like that stuff. Uh, and email was, you know, the, the business we sold to IBM was an email business, and there needed to be a certain level of conviction in the early 90s when there were, what, maybe 10 million internet users, right? That, oh, you know, email, that's the messaging tool of the future. I mean, well, that takes a little bit of shows you a lot of people jumped in thinking, and it wasn't ready. Timing was off, right? That's right. Time was up. And how many people went into dot com and then exited dot com, comparing back. it to the two of the bubble, and never to return for at least a long time, yeah. right? Yeah. Because they didn't have conviction and they weren't really prepared. So I think that's true as well. And today, I mean, I have multiple examples of this, and the most recently as well. You know, we were sort of you know, quite focused on blockchain, and blockchain was never really ready for sort of you know prime time uh, until you know suddenly the last couple of years it just exploded onto the scene. And again, it wasn't so much that we cared so much about cryptocurrency and sort of the speculative aspect, but that we very much believe in the decentralized future of what blockchain could offer. And that was sort of, you know, the impact and purpose that we're trying to develop for that. And when that opportunity came about, we were also ready because we had the skills or the contacts or the networks in place where we were able to take advantage of uh, sort of building out that decentralized future. Uh, and again, that that story is yet to prove out, right? I mean, we're still early in that journey, 
but it's developed in a way that sort of maybe five years ago, you would say, maybe not. And again, it's, there's a strong element of luck involved there as well, because, you know, it could have gone one way or the other way uh, in, in sort of in that, in that element as well. And we, we got it wrong as well. I mean, we, we invested and, and built stuff in augmented reality, mixed reality, we called it, I think in the early 2000s, you know, maybe 2000, maybe even 2007 or 8, right? Uh, AR, right? So we, as we know AR today. That was way, way too early and still has yet to sort of show promise. But we, you know, believed in its purpose and mission, but it was just, you know, too early and, 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 and sometimes we just have to say, you know, maybe this isn't, this isn't the right call, right? Um, but if it was going to take off, then we would have been ready as well. Uh, so that's, that's, that's kind of my, my perspective uh, on life. That's interesting. You have to add futurist to your job title because I think a lot of what you're talking about is kind of what happens. It sounds like you've been early a few times, which is just a timing thing. doesn't mean you're wrong. Um, but I, I, mean, I, can only, I, mean, I have this obsession with luck partly myself. It's, 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 just, it's just really to do with the fact that I look at my own path with fluid, which I know you know well. Uh, we somewhat went on a similar journey in different directions. Um, but the, I, you know, when I built fluid up, there was a point where in 2003 during SARS, it almost went bankrupt. And then in 2008 during the financial crisis, Credit Suisse was one of our biggest clients. They suddenly couldn't pay us. You can't imagine that right now. But, you know, Credit Suisse yeah. saying, sorry, we, we don't have the cash flow to pay you, you know, like Credit Suisse. So we almost went bankrupt. You know, and I, and I feel like in, by hook or by crook, a bit of luck, we survived. And then total luck, frankly, that PwC decided that they wanted to buy up uh, the independent creative agencies and, and, and create an in, a creative agency arm, you know. So, so I found it very hard to kind of tell people how brilliant I was because I started to write a book and I just got a bit obsessed with this concept of luck. And so now that's why I ask it. But your, your answer is, is, is perfect because basically, you know, there is two sides to it, isn't there? There's, I think the dictionary only really describes one, which is this chance luck. I think there needs to be a second edition in there, which is what you're talking about. I, I call it luck is a skill. So you're, you're talking about being in the right place at the right time, taking chances, taking risk to be it at the right place at the right time. Because that's what you've done throughout your career, right? You've taken chances to try and be at the right place at the right time. Yeah, look, I, I agree with that. I think, you know, to an extent, I think calling luck a skill is, is, is interesting and I think is, is probably right. Because just as you sort of the way you weathered, you know, your various crises um, came from skill. Right. I mean, luck in the sense that maybe circumstances were there, but you had the skill to navigate it. I mean, if you were running through the same circumstance in a younger version of you, maybe, right, or a different circumstance version of you, maybe that wouldn't have worked because you weren't prepared for it. You hadn't had the years of grit and experience to run, you know, through it the way that you had, or you maybe haven't had the network of people to maybe get new business from, right? Because, you know, credit switch was out, but guess what? I've got to find and hustle for new contacts. Well, guess what? Over the last five years, I made a lot of friends or I made a lot of business contacts. Here, take a discount. Or here, do something. Whatever it is, right? You had your developed network and your skill that you put out to make you overcome that uh, and then take advantage of the opportunity that would then come because you survived, right? So I think, I think you know, it is a skill in a sense. Uh, maybe not specifically around that you can conjure luck. Um, I think that's hard. Um, you know, that then we're going into the realm of sort of quantum physics and so on. I'm not really sure that sort of, you know, you know, we can talk about that maybe as, 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 a, as a definite, but, but definitely, you know, um, all credit to you uh, because, you know, you navigated it with skill. Well, I, 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 I think I navigated it in panic. <laughs> <laughs> which is a skill too right yeah I mean, some true, people work true. Really well. true but um well i mean it's it's interesting because I, 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 I your story resonates with me about your family upbringing because I, I i have the same same kind of feeling i, I sometimes say I, I was lucky that my mum kicked me out of home so young you know can't imagine you you're such a caring person kicking your son out who's 15 but my mum did and and now i thank her for it i didn't at the time but that was my bit of luck you know, my mum kicked me out, which is kind of bizarre, isn't it? So good luck and bad luck can actually be just a matter of perspective, right? Indeed. So just finishing yeah. off, just final question. If you went back to your younger self and gave some advice, what would it be? Oh, what would it be? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think maybe the main thing I would say, which is kind of what I do anyway, but essentially just, um, I, don't know. I, I think to me, a younger, what I would say is um, just look forward. That's kind of what I do anyway. 
but maybe just reinforcing that, right? Um, as a personality, um, I never really sort of look too much backwards. Um, so I think just just keep looking forward. That's 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 what I would say. It's fascinating. Well, yeah, I've really enjoyed chatting to you. What's normally a half an hour podcast is now a one hour, 10 minutes, and I still want to keep going. So um, if, if it's all right, I'd love to have you on the show again another time. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you very much. It was a, it was a great pleasure. It was mm-hmm. Great to catch up. Yeah, likewise. And I, I, I loved your insights. Thank you so much. We'll, um, we'll be in touch and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, let you know um, when the podcast goes fully live. And thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Good Luck Club podcast. We know you have thousands of podcasts you could be listening to and you've chosen us. We, of course, feel lucky. If you want to hear more, please go to thegoodluckpod.com or go to any of our social media pages and share with us your views, your insights and any way that we can improve what we're doing to make it a better experience for you. We wish you the best of luck.